Hello, welcome to my little trip down road testing memory lane. Another Q&A video today. Uh, so thanks very much for sending in all your questions and comments, much appreciated. Um, I've been on my travels. I've been to Italy, to the Modena racetrack, um, just down the road from the Ferrari factory. It's not actually the uh, Ferrari's test track, that's Fiorano, I think. But this is sort of a small circuit where Prilia launched the RS 457, which is their A2 license sports bike, um, which kind of looks like an RS660 and um, RSV4. So you can read all about that test in uh, MCN and online. It's actually online now and uh, the YouTube video as well. Um, it was good fun. It was kind of uh, organized chaos as uh, these uh, Prilio launches tend to be, but we got the job done, we got everything done. Um, but what was quite amusing, I thought, was that I would say that 90% of the journalists were kind of around about my age or older, some younger, not many young people there. And uh, it de did seem rather bizarre that we're all testing a bike designed for a sub 24 year old. Um, I mean, it was it was great fun. It was really good fun, but it kind of just goes to show that, you know, in the in the road testing world, there isn't much young blood, which kind of reflects, unfortunately, um, the world of biking. There's not much young blood in it at all, really. You know, there are exceptions. So, um, I mean, let's hope that changes soon anyway. Um, one thing I did want to say, check out my T-shirt there. It's the, it's the Fez pub in Margate, where I'm from, Dan in Margate. I bought this T-shirt just before Christmas and um, uh, James White, who's uh, one of uh, one of our viewers here, decided he fancied this T-shirt and went and got one himself. But he's a Kiwi living in Portland, USA. So um, not only does this video travel well, so do uh, Fez T-shirts. So if you're ever in Margate, give Fez a go. It's, it's an amazing little place. It's like a really small bar, loads of um, like 50s and 60s memorabilia in there. A lot of memorabilia from Dreamland as it used to be there. It's a fantastic little place. So this video, as you might have seen on the thumbnail, is called The Great Sports Bike Debate Part 2. Now, sports bikes are quite a divisive subject nowadays. Obviously, they were our bread and butter back in the day. You know, sports bikes had all the technology. Everyone wanted sports bikes. I've kind of grown up in the, in the demographic of sports bikes. You know, the average age MCM reader is more or less my age, tiny bit older. Um, and we grew up loving sports bikes, which is why I kind of, you know, in the in the 80s, 90s and noughties, they were absolutely everywhere. But now sports bike sales have, have declined, you know, because riders are getting older. Uh, sports bikes are more expensive. They've become ultra focused and you can't really use what they've got on the road. And you've got a lot more choice now with other types of bikes. Um, but the, the debate still rages on about sports bikes, about whether they're a good thing on the road or not, and lots of kind of sports bikes related questions. So I thought I'd dedicate this video to um, the love of our lives, the sports bike, and kick off with uh, the first question, which is coming up. And it's from R6 user, R6 user. I muck up these um, names all the time. I, it's only later on when I realize what they actually mean, but I think I've got that one straight off the bat, R6 user. Um, so here we go. Thanks for your question, by the way. With all due respect, and I mean that, I lose more and more respect for your opinion regarding superbikes. I appreciate how humble you are and have always considered you the best source of bike reviews available. However, I'm just sick of hearing you, your lack of enthusiasm for superbikes on the road. No doubt you are correct about the availability of more appropriate machines for the road with adequate performance, which would make a superbike for the road obsolete. Being part of the apparent declining breed who can and does push one to a high level on the road, I feel sorry for anyone who doesn't know the feeling of doing so. As you would know yourself, it's a drug. The faster you get, the less you care for how a bike looks and the more you focus on the bike setup and tires, etc. That said, naked bikes are ugly, in my opinion. 
and it is kind of nice to look at your super bike in the shed even if it is well used and chipped up from riding the ass off other faster riders my breed is keeping the fire lit and just remember that when you consider to be the inevitable does happen you're as much to blame as the rest if you would like some assistance in giving these marvels of engineering the reviews they rightfully deserve reach out to me my crew would only be too happy to help out who knows you may actually reminisce about a time when you had a set of balls a fire shining bright within and a passion to unite man and machine in a symphony of pure bliss not everyone wants to run around in a circle on track or ride the talk like the lazy granddaddy you have become uh, remember you weren't born wise learning things like safer lines trail braking loading suspension linear inputs tire pressures suspension setup delayed apexes didn't come from that scooter you run around on well thanks very much for your question <laughs> mm. a bit of two stroke in the morning i think i need that right so what i like about your uh, question is um your passion for um for super bikes and i know exactly what you where you're coming from i mean i've been riding super bikes since i was 18 in 1988 my first bike was a big bike it was a g6r 750j slingshot and i raced that and i've kind of lived and breathed super bikes all the way through my mcn career you know i've had loads of super bikes as long termers we've done countless super bike group tests i've raced super bikes um not in the super bikes but i've raced super bikes um for probably 15 years and i absolutely love them and and i'll admit i kind of see where you're coming from because i didn't think anything else existed apart from super bikes and i wasn't interested before i joined mcn and i remember joining mcn and you know i've got to admit that most people there and in the magazines didn't really share my absolute obsession with super bikes and i kind of thought that these people of influence are kind of taking theirs and my toys away by not being as into them as me and um yeah i kind of found that strange for a lot of years and if, I, if i'm honest it kind of dampened my enthusiasm for super bikes a little bit but i think naturally because i've ridden so many other bikes and because i'm older now as you say i'm a granddaddy um my kind of love of super bikes on the road has has diminished i mean i still love them on the track although now they're so quick you really need to be on your game to get the best out of them you know we rode this the fireblade a few weeks ago at porto mayo and because i haven't been racing for a long time you know the speed the braking power the absolute violence of a super bike takes a little bit of time to adjust to <clears throat> and for the road now i mean the last super bike i lived with on the road was 2019 an s1000rr had that for a year as a long termer and i absolutely loved it it actually wasn't that uncomfortable i rode it to the south of france uh, rode it to the nurberg ring heated grips brilliant um cruise control brilliant not too uncomfortable but all these things i can see that you're not really interested in you you love the speed of the super bike and you know i can absolutely see why and i think that one day you might think the same way as me and you might see that there is more to life than a super bike on the road but if you don't it absolutely doesn't doesn't matter because you know there's there's a bike for everyone and if you absolutely love super bikes then you know fill your boots i mean are there any points in here that i would uh go back to um <clears throat> Well, thank you for your offer of uh, helping me test the super bikes. You'd have to uh, give me your email address. Um, uh, yeah, you may reminisce about a time when you had a set of balls. Yeah, I probably do. <laughs> I don't deny that. Um, not everyone wants to run around in a circle on the track. I agree with you as well. Although I would say that no matter how fast you try and ride a super bike on the road, you can't get anywhere near its limits on the road. No way. You've got to be on the track. Um, 
And then learning things like safer lines, trail braking, loading suspension, linear inputs, tire pressure, suspension setup, delayed speed, apexes, didn't come from the scooter you ride around on. So I guess you're referring to my T-Max, which I absolutely love. A lot of people who ride motorcycles, period, can't understand why I love um, scooters, but I absolutely love them. I think because it's such a polar opposite to the bikes I ride every day. Um, but you can still learn all of those things on a super naked bike, on any bike. You can, you can, um, you know, learn the art of becoming a better rider, learn the art of lines, learn the art of bike setup on, on any bike. So it's a really, um, really interesting set of comments you made. Um, so thank you very much for sending them in. Um, but what I'd ask is, is you guys, what do you think, you know, do you think that super bikes have still got uh, a place on the road? Um, like I say, it's divisive. I reckon a lot of people, you know, if you've got GSX-Rs and R1s and Fireblades and whatever, you will still absolutely love them. And some of you might have had a similar journey to me where they were the be all and end all. And now, you know, they don't quite hit the spot on the road. But yeah, let me know. But thanks very much for your question. So the next one is from <clears throat> Victor Voynier. Right, so this one is about superbikes, about how despite the fact that um, people don't really buy them anymore in huge quantities, people still want to know about them. So thanks very much for your question. Hi Michael, another interesting video. So I think that was about this, the previous superbike video. Um, on the press side of things, I'm a sports bike fan and ride till I'm on the road uh, at 14 with an Aprilia RS50. Bikes have uh, first place in my heart, but as a petrol head, I'm also interested about sports cars. I can't afford one of them, but I read some of the sports cars press. I just want to read about the tech inside them, their performances, and stare at their beautiful curves. It's just about dreaming. Knowing that this Ferrari is better than this Lamborghini is useless, but it makes me happy. And it's the same about superbikes. I can't afford a V4R and would be very embarrassed behind its bars sports bikes don't make you a fast rider which is true but i want to know everything about these mighty super bikes so please keep them in the magazines looking forward to your next video cheers from paris well thank you very much for sending your question in victor um absolutely i mean most super bikes now cost well over twenty thousand pounds most of these bikes are completely out of our reach most of us can't physically ride them to their ability you know they're they're full but isn't it nice to, to read about them and, and know about them? You know, I think part of being a motorcyclist, you know, first and foremost, first and foremost, most motorcycle riders are, are motorbike fans. You know, some people just have them as transport, but most of it's, it's a passion to us. And, and part of that passion and part of that interest is, is, is gathering information about bikes, isn't it? So, you know, when you talk to your mate down the pub, you can say, oh, what about that new um, Panigale V4R with the wings? It's got 230 horsepower, blah, blah, blah. Well, you just don't have the same conversations about the SV650. Well, Martin Fitzgibbons would have the same thing about uh, SV650. But generally, you know, kind of more basic bikes. They're, they're interesting. They're actually fun to ride, but maybe not as kind of engaging when it comes to finding out about them in, in YouTube videos and... Um, and and in print so yes an interesting point you made so once again you know do you guys you still like reading about super bikes you know is, is it good for the 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 anorak the the knowledge bank or would you rather just read about bikes that are more achievable and, and more real world and more kind of relevant to what you actually do on a bike so that would be interesting so thanks very much for your question <clears throat> right this one's from Stefan. So about superbikes again, um, about whether they, they're ever gonna come back. So really enjoy the GSX-R video. Thank you very much. Um, obviously an old video. I'm a fairly new rider and never really caught the sport bike bug, but recently purchased a 94 YZF750R in a rough state, wanting to restore it and live with a piece of 90s sports bike history. Here's a question for you. Do you ever think sports bikes will make a comeback considering more and more people seem to be interested again? Thanks, love your videos. Well, thanks for your question. Um, I love your choice of bike. YZF750R Yamaha 94, amazing looking bike. That would have been top of the pile back in the day if it wasn't for the blade 
I, I believe. And of course the, the 916, but you know, if it weren't for those two bikes, it would be the best 750, I reckon. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of sports bikes make, making a comeback, I think they're, they're coming back in different ways. Um, I don't think super bikes are ever gonna make a comeback kind of en masse, they're just too expensive now. Um, manufacturers can't afford to make them affordable. Um, so you've got a choice now. There's there's a whole raft of middleweight sports bikes. You know things like the Suzuki GSX Eight R and the CBR Six Fifty R, the R Seven, the RS Six Sixty. All those kind of bikes. So that's that's where the new sports bikes are coming from. Obviously, there's some super sport bikes have made a bit of a revival in the shape of the Honda CBR Six Hundred RR and the ZX Six R. Rode both of those recently and. You know, when you get back on those bikes again, you realize that they're not actually as highly strung or as cramped as you remember them to be. And they're actually quite nice bikes and compare them to like a middleweight sports bike that's built down to a price. They're, they're different animals. They're fantastic bikes to ride. Um, <clears throat> but I think the other thing people are doing is what you've done is basically to, to look back. You know, you can't afford a 20,000 pound fire blade, but you can afford 94 YZF 750R and I think on the road you're going to get as much as a th much of a thrill out of an older super bike or sports bike as you would do a modern one okay you haven't got you know the nice nice fancy colored dashes you haven't got all the rider aids and all the rest of it but you know older bikes are none the worse for for not having that so um that's where I think sports bikes are going I think yeah people are more interested again I don't know why I think you know the our interest goes in cycles it was sports bikes and it was adventure bikes and it was retro bikes and it was super naked and I think maybe it's coming back around to sports bikes again but obviously in a different way kind of more affordable ways of getting your sports bikes kicks and, and maybe not as extreme as, as they used to be where you know super bikes now have all got over 200 horsepower and they're a little bit irrelevant uh, for the road even though they look nice um but yeah great question next uh this one is about sports bikes and abs so this is from alan davis 3726 hi nisi why does abs on sports bikes get such a bad rap rep um i have a 09 fireblade and it's my first bike with abs i find it extremely confidence inspiring especially after watching an mcm video on the abs fireblade film when it was first released, I think I would have done that one, um, where the system was praised. I understand that on track ABS is a hindrance, but for the road I wouldn't want to go back to non-ABS, so why do many people speak about uh, speak badly about such a system? Good question. Right, so um, let's just talk about ABS on sports bikes, N not ABS as it was before, you know, that started life on BMWs probably. Um, so the first proper sports bike with ABS was your 09 Fireblade and the 09 CBR600RR. Um, it had linked ABS, which a lot of bikes do, but it also had brake by wire. So there's no physical connection in normal braking circumstances between the lever and the brake calipers. There's hoses that go to an ABS pump and the ABS pump decides what to put into the calipers based on wheel speeds and all those um, all the data it gathers from the bike. Um, but in an emergency situation, if uh, something fails, you get your direct connection back between the lever and the caliper as kind of a fail safe. <clears throat> so um, when that blade first came out, the ABS was actually quite good. Um, we rode the bike in Qatar and we actually, MCM paid their own way to get there because it was at the financial uh, crash and Honda UK just decided to stop all activities so we were going to be on that launch with them but they decided not to do it so we actually uh, went there ourselves we were the only British uh, journalist there British magazine there um, and we rode around a track and uh, the ABS didn't get in the way you wouldn't really know, know it had ABS maybe under really extreme braking you could feel it pulse through the lever but it wasn't really a problem um, and then they set up a, a sand runway in the paddock and actually imported the sand from somewhere else because the sand in Qatar wasn't good enough for what they needed. I think it was too rough. They wanted something fine. Um, and we did some braking tests and it was brilliant. They invited us to sort of come up to this sand runway at about 50 mile an hour, jam on the brakes, 
and the bike just stopped. No, no drama at all. We then did some other tests uh, with that bike with some MCM readers where we had a non-ABS and a, an ABS blade. Everyone preferred the ABS blade in an emergency braking situation. We could beat the stopping distance with practice, but um, in a like bang, braking, um, emergency braking, the ABS stopped better. Um, so it was all good. ABS on sports bikes was kind of good up until about 2015 maybe with the R1. I think the R1 would have been the first Japanese super bike with an IMU. And then ABS took a bit of a, a dive. So a lot of ABS systems, especially Japanese, not so much the Europeans, um, with IMUs became pretty bad. The performance was okay on the road, but um, the feel was completely gone from the brakes. So, you know, using the R1 as an example, the 15 R1 has got really wooden brakes because it feels even more synthetic than, than it does anyway because it's brake by wire. So you just feel like you're pulling on a rubber bung, which really you are, I suppose, rather than feeling the, the caliper and the pads and running up through your through the lever and through through your arms and through your body and um, so that generation of abs had no feel so it wasn't very pleasant to use and given that braking is like almost half of your riding when that's not there it's not as nice and then on track first of all the ABS you haven't got that nice feel and then the abs is over conservative so it will let the brakes off, especially when you trail bike, break into corners. And my GSX-R1000R, 2017 long-term, I did this. You trail brake into a corner. And because the system starts to freak out because you're losing grip and the wheel speeds are doing funny things, and the system lets off. So you end up with no brakes going into a corner. And the other thing with um, kind of basic Japanese ABS systems is when you brake really, really hard, and the rear wheel starts to lose grip, it starts to spin faster than the front, then it lets the brakes off because it thinks the bike's starting to skid. Um, so this is why a lot of um, sort of sophisticated ABS systems that you'll see on Ducatis and Triumphs and BMWs have a rear wheel lift sensor that can be switched off so the rear ABS can be deactivated. But if it hasn't got that, you know, that generation of ABS that's why it's got kind of such a, a bad rap. Um, but now they seem to have turned the corner over the last couple of years. Like the new Fireblade is a point in uh, a, a, a good point because the ABS still feels a little bit wooden, but the power's there and the consistency's there. So I think ABS has turned the corner now. Um, so yeah, I think ABS on your your own nine Fireblade is really really good. But I think later bikes just aren't, um, and it's a real shame. Even if you pull the fuse out, you kind of get a bit of the performance back, but you know, you've still got a convoluted system where you've got all these hoses that run to a, an ABS unit under the seat and then back out again. The ABS units, the early ones are about 10 kilos, so they're quite heavy as well. So that's what the whole ABS problem is all about. Um, but for sort of dedicated track riding, you don't need it. You know, I had it on, actually on my race bike. In IDM, uh, BMW developed like a, an, an a ABS system for racing where it basically disabled the rear and, and you're able to brake really, really hard with it. But really, you don't, you don't need it on the, on the track, even in the wet, really, you know, with sticky wets, with good suspension and lots of feel through the bike. Um, you don't really need the ABS when it comes to racing. And I know some people say that cars with ABS perform better than cars without ABS but obviously uh, they've got four big tyres lots of uh, grip and uh, the dynamics are slightly different aren't they so anyway great question thank you very much how are we doing for time Oof. right this one is all about this one is all about superbike comfort so this is from WO388 thanks for your question hi Nizi love the channel and hearing your answer everyone's questions Track bike selection for you. I'm 35, six foot, 185 pounds. I'm pretty consistently in the mid pack of the intermediate group. I'm athletic, but flexibility has always been a struggle for me. 
I only started track riding three years ago, doing between six to 12 track days a year. I have quite a few old injuries and have issues both with my right hip with regards to peg position and my back and neck when it comes to getting in the tuck. I've tried all kinds of changes to aftermarket clip-ons, rear sets and seat, seat pan without relief. Should I continue to suck it up with a sports bike ergos and try to improve my flexibility? Or should I give up and go for a naked bike as a track bike? <clears throat> I should add that I have no intention of ever racing. I like to track ride for fun and continue to build my skills, but it would be nice to get the bump to advance at some point. Well, good question. So sports bike wise, yeah, I can see exactly why you think they're cramped. I have a similar problem. My, after a couple of accidents I had when I was younger, I can't bend my knees fully. Um, so I sh really struggle on road going super bikes. My race bike, however, is probably roomier than a touring bike because I've got quite a high seat, a standard high seat. I think it's an alpha racing seat and my foot pegs are really, really low. And um, honestly, that is so roomy. My bars are quite splayed out and it's an absolute pleasure to, to ride. So, you know, maybe obviously you've experimented with different parts, but, you know, if you go for a really tall seat, that could help. Uh, you haven't said which bike you've got. Uh, things like ZX10s are really cramped, Fireblades are really cramped. But you know, if you wanted to stick with a sports bike, um, R1s are quite roomy, um, so they're worth considering, like the new generation from 15 onwards. Um, Ducati Panigales are really, really roomy. You know, whether it's the first 1199 all the way up to the V4, so that's going to give you a lot more room to move around if you consider one of those. Um, and obviously super nakeds have got the most room. So I'd say all super nakeds without exception, none of them are really cramped. I guess the most spacious ones would be an MT10, really spacious, really fantastic um, track tool as well as a road bike. KTM Super Dukes, really, really roomy. They're fantastic for tall riders. Tuonos are a bit smaller, S1000Rs are a bit smaller. Um, so. I'd say you get your thrills and you'd be able to easily operate in the advanced group on a super naked. Um, they're much easier to ride. You know, you even try and street triple like RSs, the 765s, they're roomy, they're easy to ride, they're really, really fast as well. So, you know, nakeds are really good. Um, the only disadvantage with the naked is they tire you out a lot more because the wind's trying to pull you off the back the whole time. So, you know, you end up after four or five sessions with a sore neck, sore shoulders, sore arms. Um, and yeah, you're not gonna go as fast down the straights as a super bike because of the wind resistance and you're not quite gonna have the feel going into the corners because you're not over the front wheel as much. So kind of in answer to your question, you know, if, if, if a super bike, no matter how spacious it is, isn't gonna um, do it for you, then you know, a super naked is definitely a, a really good kind of second choice. And yeah, any any one of them, whichever one you fancy, but I'd say the roomiest is a super duke. So uh, yeah, great question. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> this one's from Lee Tilbury. This is about uh, Superbike Electronics. So thanks for your question, Lee. I have a question, Michael. Is my 2019 R1 and similar bikes with good electronics uncrashable from ham-fisted throttle at lean in the wet and braking hard when cornering too? Are the electronics that good? Well, no, you can still crash. You can still crash with electronics. I've crashed many times on my race bike and that's got electronics. I've seen um, lots of crashes at um, launches on bikes with electronics. So, you know, you can't, can't overcome the laws of gravity, unfortunately. Um, in terms of trash control, trash control is good when you're lifting the bike up out the corner. You, you've got you've got the the rear tire dug in. You've got the weight transferred to the back. You've cracked the throttle, and then from that moment onwards, you can just go full throttle and lean on the trash control. In those scenarios, it's very very unlikely you're going to crash, but if you are full lean and just crack the throttle with no rear weight transfer and, and with the, the bike lent right over, the G-force is trying to push it out to the edge of the track on that tiny little bit of tire, it's easy for it to go sideways and it will go sideways and it will grip whether it's got electronics or not 
and then high side you. <clears throat> if the electronics are on really, really intrusively, that won't happen, but the bike's gonna feel so slow and be so slow coming out of corners. It's not worth having a super bike. So electronics aren't really gonna help you there. Anti-wheelie will stop you flipping, definitely. Um, and for the most part, ABS will stop you um, it, it will stop you losing the front in a straight line. So straight line breaking in the wet, it will be Im impossible to, to crash on ABS. But then as soon as you start to lean, then obviously you are, you, you've got the, the, the force pushing you out of the corner. So the tire struggling to hang on um, and you haven't got a lot of grip at the front. And then the other thing that happens, probably more in MotoGP and proper racing than on the road, is when you've got a lot of lean angle and then you start to get on the throttle, the weight goes to the back of the bike, takes the weight off the front tire and it can fold. So I would never lean on electronics to go fast around the track. Um, they're just really nice safety aids really. And when you get to a high level, World Superbike and MotoGP, electronics are used to tame stupid amounts of power and to um, prolong tire life. Um, most of those riders can go just as fast with no electronics. It's not like they need them there or they need a safety net. They're there really to control obscene amounts of power and yeah, um, look after tires. So I wouldn't um, just go maximum brakes, maximum throttle in corners on your R1. I'd still ride it, you know, properly and then have the electronics there in the background. And really when you're on track, you want the electronics on such a minimum setting when you're going fast you, you just can't go fast with electronics on 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 anything other than minimum especially on road bikes you know when you get to racing bikes and you've got teams of data engineers analyzing your data and changing electronics here there and everywhere you know you can get away with electronics maybe helping you a little bit but on road bikes they're either way too intrusive or or they're hardly there so yeah my advice is just to ride the bike normally a great question and finally, um, it's from uh, Pillokan, Pillokan, Pillokan. Anyway, thanks for your question. So this one's about Super Naked again. Um, and just an opinion really. Um, super bikes are a chore at lower speeds. Therefore, the Super Naked, i.e. factory street fighters, um, I guess you mean aren't a bad choice for the streets. Um, for instance, the older Super Duke 1290R is a much better street bike than the new one with the RC8R frame or the Panigale V4 or the S1000S MT10 and so on. So yeah, I guess what you're saying is, thanks for your question, um, Super Nakers are just more rideable on the, on the road. You know, we all know that Super Bikes are fast around the track, but you can have a lot better time for more of the time. Uh, on a super naked on the road, but maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? I know, uh, I know the the chap who asked the first question probably wouldn't agree. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that is the great uh, sports bike debate. Um, let me know what you think. Um, but in the meantime, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for sticking around to the end of this quite long video. Um, and if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and uh, stay tuned for more like this coming very soon.